how often am I actually doing these things that I love? And if it's not very much, then maybe we need to rethink our priorities about why is it that we don't have the time to do the things that we love. And so much of that has to do with because we have to pay for the expensive car and the trip that we just took that we didn't use points for. <laughs> you know, like all these things that add up to where we're like stressed out about, out about having to pay off this, this, and that. And this is an interesting thing. So every $100 of recurring expenses that you can cut out of your life per month is actually $30,000 less that you need to reach financial independence, 30,000. Most people spend 500 to $1,000 a month on their car. So we're talking about a $1,000 car payment, right? That fancy car, you're leasing it forever, 1,000 bucks a month. That's $300,000 more you need to reach financial independence with that thousand bucks a month. I had my prior car for 15 years. It gets me from point A to point B. And when you compound all the money that I've saved on that, it literally is hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like I, I kid you not, that's what it comes out to. So it can be a massive difference. I think a lot of people would like, yeah, I'd like a new car, like that sounds nice, but how much is that worth it to you compared to the results and the reward of what you're saying that, hey, if you saved it, is that worth more than the nice car? And that's the inspiring part. Cause I think a lot of people are like, yeah, I would love a nice car, but do you love that more than the ability to retire this many years earlier and having that X amount of money double, quadruple if you just invest it and buy the cheaper car? Like that's the thing that I have to do in my brain. Yeah, I love that thought process. That was Brad Barrett, a certified public accountant, personal finance expert, and host of the Top 50 Business Podcast, Choose FI. He has a passion for financial independence and helping people take action to make their lives richer in every way, with focus points on money-saving hacks, having a positive mindset, and living a happier, healthier, more intentional life. Brad achieved financial independence at 35 and lives in Virginia with his wife and two daughters. He was featured in the Playing With Fire documentary, one that I recommend to people all the time. Definitely go watch it. You do not want to miss out on this episode though, because I found a big boost of inspiration in my own personal goals and financial independence. You might find yourself reevaluating your life or some big financial decisions by the end of this. So let's get into it and enjoy the episode. Okay, so I love slow fashion. I'd rather buy a couple quality pieces of clothing and wear them over and over again for ages knowing that the product was made sustainably than buy cheap new clothing every season with the ever-changing fashion trends, contributing to more and more waste. Enter Indigo Luna. I am so amazed, you guys, by how beautifully made and how high quality their clothing is and how soft it is. They're an ethically made small business of yoga wear, swim, intimates, and more. Their material is sustainably sourced. Everything is cut, sewn, and dyed by a loving human hand, and they ensure that every person involved in production works in comfortable, safe conditions. I'm amazed at how flattering and comfortable their clothing is. Every time I go into the closet, I want to reach for my indigo clothing pieces because they hug my curves just right and just make me feel so good throughout the day and I feel comfortable yet beautiful. Everything is made in these beautiful simple shapes with earthy colors and plant dyes from recycled or organic materials. This is the type of thing that is totally worth spending my money on. I love being intentional in the way that I spend my money on my clothing. By buying less but high quality pieces that last in my closet for years. I feel so good about my purchases and I love what I'm wearing. So I got you guys a discount code. Enter the code Ellen10 for 10% off your order or click the link in the show notes. By using my link, you're supporting the podcast to stay up and running. So thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Brad, for being here. Um, I'm really excited for this conversation. For anybody who doesn't know, a while ago, I made a YouTube video called How to Become Financially Free. This was about three years ago, and I was talking to my friend uh, Quinn and telling him about how I'm creating this video, and he's like, oh, you know what? There's this guy, Brad, who is in Maui right now on a vacation or something like that, and he's yeah. like, he has this awesome financial independence podcast. You should see if you could chat with him for the video. So I emailed you, or I forget, maybe Quinn connected us. Yeah. And it was so awesome to be able to just hop over to the place you were staying at for your vacation. And I just asked you a few questions for the YouTube video. I love how that video turned out. And thanks for coming on that before. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, it's great. I that, that did work out incredibly, incredibly well with the timing, fortuitous timing. Yeah, we were actually, my family was visiting Maui essentially for a month, which is kind of part of financial independence and the beauty of of having options, which I think to me is how I look at Phi anyway. And one of those options was, hey, 
let's go to Maui for for three or four weeks and and hang out. So yeah, it was neat yeah. uh, that Quinn connected us and that we got to meet. Yeah, totally. So we've met before. We're doing this one virtually, but we have met before, which was really cool. So for anyone listening who doesn't know, what does financial independence mean exactly? Yeah. So, okay. So there's the, the technical definition, let's say, which we can go into. But, but I think what I, what I just talked about is, is really the more important aspect of it. It's instead of, instead of living f- and working for material things and just kind of really wasting your life energy on, on things that don't matter necessarily to you and might just be like, oh, the person next door bought a fancy whatever car or whatever it may be, fill in the blank. So of course I'm going to do that. It's, it's just kind of, it's waking up from, from just sleepwalking. And I think, I think it's imply, uh, applying some intentionality to life with the umbrella of getting your finances straight. Because when you're stressed financially, nothing else matters, right? If if you are living paycheck to paycheck, you're in the red every month, you have to take out loans or, you know, payday loans or credit cards. That's the stress that is pervasive in your entire life. And I think once you start on a path towards being financially free, everything in your life gets better. Because, and it's not about you have to reach the technical definition of financially independent and never work again. Like to me, that's, that's irrelevant. It's that very first time. Again, if you were living paycheck to paycheck and you have a thousand dollars saved up, 5,000, 10,000, imagine how many more options you have in your life. Imagine how much less stressful your life is because what used to be an emergency right? Like a flat tire or my washer and dryer, whatever, something broke. That's not an emergency. That's just life because you have, you have the savings, you have some net worth, you have some space where you're not stressed about this all the time. So I think that's kind of the, the overarching theme of, okay, let's get some space. Let's give ourselves some options, some flexibility, some freedom. And then it's like this cascade, Ellen, it's this wonderful cascade of everything in your life gets better because you can focus on the things that actually matter. You can focus on your health and your relationships and your community. And hey, what do I want my finite time on this planet to look like, right? Like we get 80, 90 years if we're lucky. And so many of us spend it working in jobs that we don't really love. And if there's a way to kind of step off that hamster wheel by being intentional and saving and reframing saving money from oh, this is horrible, this is deprivation, I'm on a a financial diet, to, oh, wow, you mean I get to buy back the only resource that matters, which is my time. And I think that changes everything. Yeah, so you were in featured in a documentary, which I recommend to people all the time, Playing With Fire. Anybody listening or watching this that hasn't seen that documentary, definitely go check that one out. It's very inspiring. By the end of the documentary, you're going to be just rethinking your whole life (laughs) for sure. So how does this differ from maybe like the Dave Ramsey financial peace uh, way, because I did interview Rachel Cruz on the podcast a while ago about, you know, getting out of debt and starting to save and that aspect. So what's different about what like you advocate for or just like the financial independence community advocates for compared to that? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think Dave Ramsey and his entire organization, obviously you spoke with Rachel, his daughter, I think they have done marvelous things for tens of millions of people. And the impact that they've had on this world is remarkable. And you will never hear me say a bad word about Dave Ramsey or or anyone in, in his sphere in that regard. I think what they do is they get people from a position where they're most likely in debt things that the, the house is on fire in essence, their hair is on fire financially and, and they have to take drastic steps. And I think, the cut and dried nature of his seven baby steps, there's no equivocating with it, right? It's just, this is clear. You need, you know what you need to do. And then you're at a point where, okay, I I forget what his seventh is, but it's like, uh, you know, 
donate and live whatever, like live in abundance, right? It was something it's like the live, live like no one else so that later you can live and give like no one yes. else, which I love that. Which is wonderful. And giving, I mean, that's, that's a beautiful part of living a, a, a wealthy life, living a well-balanced life. So I, I really genuinely love everything that he does, but, but I think he's very doctrinaire about, hey, credit cards are evil. You can never, 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 never open a credit card. You should not, I guess, put in, I think one of his was, uh, don't get your 401k match. And I don't want to get into the weeds of the, of the little minutia of, of personal finance. But for me, your 401k match for anybody listening who has a retirement account, that is free money. So that is like, wow, I can get essentially a hundred percent return on my money by getting the match at my company. And that's part of my salary in essence. But Dave says, don't focus on that. Focus first on getting out of debt. And, and again, I get it because that's part, of, that's part of the step. So I think how I choose to look at financial independence versus Dave Ramsey's message is FI is really for people who, who are looking for that next step. And you like know, once you get beyond- Like maybe they're at the sixth or seventh, yeah. Yeah, right. Once you get there and maybe you're looking, and, and I don't want to say that we have like advanced strategies because I actually don't think about- there are advanced strategies, certainly, but that's not like a prerequisite for being a part of the financial independence community. It's uh, those things are available, but if you're looking for a little bit, a little bit more, you're looking maybe like I do. I use credit card rewards points to travel the world, and I use credit cards. To me, a credit card is my most valuable financial tool when used properly. But again, Dave has it right in the sense that tens of millions of people get in credit card debt. So of course you want to steer clear of it if that if you're worried about that. But for me, I have a you know decent net worth. I have a significant net worth and and I'm not worried about having an issue paying off my credit card. So I a credit card is a bonanza for me. It's free it's free money, right? So Well, cuz for you you have the habit of paying it off down to zero every single month, paying it all the way off. And so I love Dave Ramsey's message and Rachel Kurz's message of like, look, a lot of people spend more than they would if they weren't using a credit card. I mean, like they spend more using a credit card than they would if they were paying cash or whatever. So that message is so helpful for so many people who need to like get into the habit of what you're doing of paying only for what you can afford, what you can actually Absolutely. And that's almost right verbatim away. what I say is like, don't use a credit card unless you can pay on time and in full every single month. If you're not doing that, don't just cut up the card, forget we even had this talk, you know, like don't even think about it. But so, yeah, so I think we apply a, a similar level of intentionality, but it, it's more, it's more, it's broader, I guess, is, is how I look at it is, okay, there are lots of different things you can do. Again, when you're fin- it, it's that little bit of financial savvy of, hey, it's not my, the house is on fire. Once I've got some stability, I now am focusing on a savings rate. Right. So I'm focusing on how can I cut things out of my life, not for like a diet sake, not for this is short termism. We think long term. Right. That's what the FI community, I think what typifies the FI community so much is we think long term and I focus on things I value. So I, I don't think anybody would look at my life and say I'm cheap or miserly at all. Like I, I'm rolling in abundance, but I'm doing it very intentionally based on what I value right? So I value my health and fitness. I spend a boatload of money every month on my health and fitness. I value automobiles essentially zero. So I'm driving a 2013 Honda Civic. And before that, I had a 2003 Honda Civic until about two years ago. I don't care at all. I'm not trying to look rich. I don't care about that. I want to spend where I want to spend money, where I get the most value from it. So I I think... Though that that's a very long answer to your short question, Ellen, but it, but I think it's really important. And then you know, obviously, we we get into crazy strategies, and there's all sorts of there's so many smart people in the financial independence community, and that's what's really great about it is it is this worldwide community of people who are living more intentionally, and you get people from all different backgrounds and knowledge bases, and it it's really cool when you can kind of come together and we call it like crowdsourcing the best information and. It just cuts through the learning curve, right? Like you don't have to learn it all on your own. You don't have to be the smartest person in the world because you have this community at your back. And I I think that's really powerful. 
Yeah. And essentially like the, the message that Dave Ramsey and Rachel Coos are, are sharing is, is a lot of the same things. Like it's all within the same community of like financial independence. Um, I feel like, but is, is, I feel like the playing with fire might have a little bit more emphasis on the retiring early aspect. Yeah. Do you think? Yeah. And to me that, you know, I think the biggest and why you, you keep hearing me say financial independence or the five movement, it's not in my mind, it's not the fire movement, even though that it's, it's so catchy, right? Like, I mean, that, that's really why it has caught on and has continued to catch on, even though we have done our damnedest to, uh, to get rid of that, the RE, because I think honestly, it's a distraction. It's the financial independence retire early for anybody who's who's not intimately familiar with it. But the retire early, it carries so much baggage. And and I think people like to get caught up in that and then throw out all the beautiful message of financial independence and just focus on that ridiculous retire early of, oh, is this people who are just looking to opt out of life, who don't want to be productive members of society or whatever other nonsense thing they come up with. That's, you know, just straw man argument. Right. And, and I think to me, like, I don't know one person who has retired early and sat around on a beach and sipped umbrella drinks all day. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah, it's, it's, it's such a distraction, but, but yeah, I mean, I think retiring early in the sense that you don't want to go, to a soul sucking job that you're just doing to earn money. And in return, you're giving up the only resource that actually matters. And that's your time. Right. And, and like, I'm not anti job. Obviously we have to work. We have to earn income. It's even if, even if you look at it as just a means to an end, it's still valuable. So like, I'm not anti job at all, but do I think working in a job after you've reached financial independence, a job that you maybe don't like, do I think that makes sense? I, I really don't. Uh, I think you should probably, you know, depending on your situation, think about finding something else to do valuable with your time. And so I, yeah. I think that's kind of the subtle distinction that I, I like to make with the, the retire early aspect of it. Yeah. When I think of retire early, I just think that I have the freedom to do what I love doing, yeah. not to just sit on the couch and veg out all day. It's that that's not even something I would want to do. Yeah. It's just that I would have the freedom to do exactly what drives me and inspires me. And that involves work. Like work is something very like natural, I feel like, yeah. but it's work that you love. Like that's just, at least that's my yeah. motivating thought. No, process. I love I mean, it. I love my job. I love my job. And I love that. Like, this is my job that I have, like my podcast and my channel and everything. But but getting to a point where Andrew and I have our goals, I'd be like, okay, now I can just do it based on based on what I love, not based on, oh, I need to make sure that I tick this and get this amount. Does that make sense? Or I could focus more on homeschooling with the kids and do less or whatever. It makes perfect sense. And I think that is that is exactly what Fahe is all about. And I love that that's what you've gleaned from. And it's, it's so cool that, again, you did that video a couple years ago and, and watched Playing With Fire. And I, I, I'm curious, like, how did, it, how did it impact you? Oh, that's such a good question. I think it just is very motivating to keep, um, to keep on this like path that we're inspired by to be careful with our money, be intentional with the way that we're spending our money and um, the way that we're bringing it in and then knowing what to do with it. My husband is very good at, um, he's just always been very good at um, being not spending very much. He's a quite frugal person. He also doesn't have a very materialistic at all mindset. Like he could, he cares zilch <laughs> about looking rich or whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, and for me, I enjoy spending money on nicer things, cer- like certain th- items, like quality furniture. Whereas my husband would be more likely to be like, Oh, let's get the cheaper thing. And so that aspect after watching the documentary is just helpful to keep, okay, there's certain things where we can spend less on and we don't need this particular thing and our long-term goals. It's just inspiring to continue on that path. Yeah, that's great. And I, I think one of the things that jumped out to me from that movie in particular was how, how the filmmaker Scott Rickens and his wife Taylor, how, they, how it brought them closer together. Right. And it sounds like you and Andrew, that, that that's been mm-hmm. the case as well in the sense that like people are coming from different different backgrounds and different standpoints. And like if this can help foster conversations over things that it really money is one of the last great taboos and it doesn't have to be. And that to me is one of the most beautiful aspects of this is that, wow, we can talk about this. We can be on the same team because we actually have a goal now. 
right? Like we have something like a North star to shoot for. And that looks different for every family or every person, every situation, because I can't tell you what your life should look like or wants to, that, that's nobody's place. But, but once you start talking about this, then you can dream big and you can figure out how do we, how do we get there? What does there even look like? Or what are the things that I like doing? I think that was one of the most poignant aspects of the movie was, was uh, Scott asked his wife Taylor to write down, and I think this would be a good exercise for everybody listening, is write down the five or 10 things that you really most love doing on a, a day-to-day or week-to-week basis. And I think they were both very surprised on both of their lists at how few of those things actually cost money cost any dollars. I think the the most expensive was like have a glass of wine together and that could cost as little as or little or as much as you want, right? And like it's it once you see it on paper, it's it's an incredible thing because then okay, th- there's no there's no lying here. We we have it on paper what what this means and how does this impact our plan going forward and and what do we want that plan to look like? So anyway, it's uh, it's all part and parcel, but I, I think that's a pretty good exercise for everybody. I think that's such a good idea too because people might write down what they love doing and see how often am I actually doing these things that I love. And if it's not very much, then maybe we need to rethink our priorities about why is it that we don't have the time to do the things that we love. And so much of that has to do with because we have to pay for the expensive car and the mortgage and the trip that we just took that we didn't use points for, <laughs> you know, like all, all these things that add up to where we're like stressed out about, yeah. out about having to pay off this, this and that. Yeah. But if we're mindful with our money, then we can work less, do do less of what we have to do to make our income, right? And then more of what we actually really love, which tends to be free. Yeah, it's so fascinating, right? And and yeah, to your point, which is brilliant of, hey, you're you're paying, you're working to pay for all of these things that you can't use because you're working all the time. It's like this yeah. horrible recursive loop of like, yes. oh my God, I, I bought an expensive car and a fancy house that I'm not using yeah. because I'm working all the time to pay for the things. And I bought them yes. maybe just to yes. make myself feel better that you know, I yeah. need some luxury or something. It's so silly. I know. It's so interesting. And going back to like how my husband and I, our mindsets, like over time, I've become so much better. I mean, I've always been good about saving. Like even when I was in college, I would work to save, but then I would save that money to spend it on like a frivolous thing that I definitely don't have in my life anymore, you know, some kind of material thing. And so over time, that material drive has become, has gotten less and less. But Andrew has just always been at that where he just doesn't need nice things for the most part of his life. And so when we're together, I'll, I'll be like, oh, we should we should get this thing. And he's like, yeah, but if we spend that amount of money on that, then we're going to have to, you know, work this much longer and all that. I'm like, ah, oh, you're right. <laughs> Maybe we don't need that. <laughs> oh, so it's good. It's good to have two different, I feel like, a, ba- a balance in a couple. Like, is your is your partner the same on the same path as you or one of you more of a spender than the other? Yeah, it's a good question. So. Uh, yeah, my wife, Laura, is is also fairly, she's naturally frugal. She's actually probably more naturally frugal than I am. So, you know, we're, we were pretty lucky from the beginning. Like, I wish I had, I almost wish, frankly, that I had some, like, cool story of, like, overcoming. But, but we were both, we were both natural savers. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting because I think there are people of all types. I, I'm thinking about my own podcast, right? So, like, my, uh, my, uh, longtime co-host he actually just stopped a couple of months ago but uh his name is jonathan and and him and i are the exact opposites he he calls himself the reluctant frugalist and i'm like the natural <laughs> saver which is uh, mm, so i like that word reluctant frugalist i like that <laughs> right i think that's and i think a lot of people really relate to relate to that because i think he looked at it as oh this is this is serving a larger purpose you know, in his case, it's uh, it's buying electronic gadgets. And if, okay, if I don't buy all these electronic gadgets, you mean I can now maybe reach a point of financial independence where I can spend time with my kids or do, do these other things that actually matter to me? And like, I think most of us, I know it sounds crazy, but like we don't connect our spending with our time. And I think that was what was so beautiful about the book, Your Money or Your Life, that came out decades ago with Vicky Robin and Joe Dominguez. And it's, it's talking about literally your life energy, 
goes into every purchase you make. And it's just that, that thought. And, and you know, it's not to say don't make purchases that, that clearly I, I want to make entirely clear to everybody listening. Like I am not miserly. I'm not cheap. I'm not nothing of the sort. It's just, I think it's important to be intentional. And I think like once you break that, that habit loop of just, Hey, I have money. I'm going to go buy something because it feels good in the moment. Like, and you just, you just create that little bit of space right between the stimulus and the response. And it may, it does make a huge difference. And especially then further still, when you have this, this goal, this guiding light of, okay, this is what I, this is what I actually want out of my life. Because, you know, Ellen, to me, it, like one of, I, I'm not one of these like anti-media people, but, but I think, I think what the media often gets wrong with personal finance is, is they make it seem so difficult. They make it seem impossible. You hear all the time, like 98%, yeah, I'm making this up, obviously, 98% of Americans will never be able to retire. Or they're, you know, you hear like, they're going to live off cat food. And it's like, is social security going to be there? And like, when people hear those kind of things, they essentially just throw their hands up. Right, like, or the Susie Ormans of the world telling you you need ten million dollars to retire, right? Like, if you need ten million dollars to retire, then why even bother? Who's going to get to ten million dollars? Like, what percent of people are going to have ten million dollars? One out of ten thousand? I mean, what are we talking here? So the other nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine people, they throw their hands up and they say, "This is stupid. Why do I even bother?" As opposed to what we do in the financial independence community, which I think is really one of the biggest positive aspects is is we we create like a very simple equation and this is not for anybody who's not a math lover this is uh it should not turn you off because what this actually does is hey i control what my number is i control what my life costs okay and then therefore i know how much income i need every year to cover my life. So for instance, let's just very simply, let's say your life costs, it doesn't matter. That's the beautiful thing also. It doesn't matter if your life costs $40,000 a year, $100,000 or $500,000 a year. It's, it's just an equation, but there's some certainty and there's some control to it of saying, okay, Susie Orman says I need 10 million, but what the heck, why 10 million? That, that doesn't make any sense to me. Like my life costs $50,000 a year. That's what I actually need to cover. Okay, so you can do that with some kind of side hustles, some you know passive income if that exists, or just living off of some of your investments. So I think that's why we say, okay, you need to have a net worth. You need to save during your working years, and then you get to a point where you have some assets, and because those assets grow every year, you can pull some of that money out, and in theory, it won't exhaust itself. So you can pull some of that money out. Now, again, I don't want to get bogged down in the math, but just very simply, hey, if your life costs, let's just say $80,000 a year, I think that's probably a number that, that people could, could relate to. You just multiply that amount by 25, okay? So in that case, it is $2 million. So that would be your FI number. You're financially independent, you're financially independent when you have a $2 million net worth. Now, again, that's a big number. I'm not, not, not saying anything otherwise, but you control it, right? So what if you paid off your mortgage? What if you paid off your cars and your life only costs $40,000? Well, now you just cut that fine number in half, right? So you only need a million dollars because you can pretty reliably pull about 4% out of that, that pot, which is why a million dollars, 4% of a million dollars is... $40,000. So that's, that's kind of how this number works. And again, let's not get bogged down in the math, but just knowing that it's not some elusive they, it's not the media, it's not Susie, it's not even Dave Ramsey or me or anybody telling you, you have to have X number of dollars. It's just, Hey, I control what my life costs. And then therefore I know roughly what my fine number is going to be. And that's, there's great value psychologically, especially in, in having some sense of what that is. Yeah, and someone might even hear you and be like, even a million dollars, how am I going to, that's going to take me forever to save that amount of money. But this doesn't mean that you're like, oh, I'm going to retire the next three years five, or even five or 10 years. But what you can see is like the long-term goal of, look, 
being intentional with the way I spend my money now is going to potentially affect how early I'm going to be able to retire, even maybe 10 years earlier than I thought I was actually going to have to retire. And that 10 years makes a difference. Even 15 years, like it just depends on how how um, far you're willing to go, how much like how hard you're willing to work mm-hmm. for one in the beginning, right? And, and how much how frugal you're willing to be, which could equal buying a five thousand dollar car cash instead of getting a forty thousand dollar car. You know that that those types of things make big differences in the long run. And I love what you said about the. Um, how few people are being intentional with the way that they spend because you think you're like in the in the now and you're like, oh, this just feels good. And I want to give an example of um, a friend of mine who she loves to spend. She'll totally admit that. And that's part of her love language even is spending money on people that she loves and her children and stuff like that. So came over for a play date once and she's like, I'm going to bring some snacks. I'm like, great. That sounds great. Come over for a play date. We'll all play outside. The kids will play football. And she came over with like 10 of these like amazing mangoes. They're these like incredible keat mangoes that cost like $7 a pound here on the on the island. And she brought like 10 of them and like five or six different like craft kombuchas. And the kids were all so excited for it. I'm like, dang, you just spent $100 on snacks. <laughs> I'm like, that's so nice of you. And so, so nice. And then later as we got in the conversation about finances, because she's like super interested in it, I'm like, well, as an example, like you could have just bought like two of those mangoes and that still would have been a really special treat and we didn't really need like seven or eight and you would have saved a lot of money just there. So like little things like that, like add up over time. And that's just like a little example I thought of. No, it's a great example. And, and I mean, I think maybe even to like add on to that is, sometimes then like to me the spice of life is getting together with friends Mm -hmm. or like that's Mm -hmm. what I want to get out of it and sometimes if people feel oh this is like a heavy lift I know your friend isn't in this situation but like oh it's going to cost us $40 for a potluck when like I just want my friends to come over like I you know Mm -hmm. like it's sometimes the money gets in the way and Mm -hmm. I, I know it's kind of a like a random tangent but you, you wonder sometimes, like, what is the essence? I think this is ultimately what, I, what I'm getting at is, like, what is the essence of, of what you're doing? And, and I think, like, like, for me, the example that I always use is my wife and I would always love to, uh, to go out to, like, uh, craft breweries. Right. So, uh, I'm not a beer, a big beer drinker anymore. I'm kind of, uh, I'm gluten free now, but, but it, back in the day we, we used to, and, and I think we looked at each other and we're like, you know, every time we go out, it's costing us 30, 40, $50, even just like, you know, for three beers, something crazy. We actually just want to spend time together. So what we did was we wound up going to our local grocery store where they have an amazing beer selection and we got just a bunch of fun six packs and they cost a dollar or a dollar fifty a beer. Right. And and again, it's not necessarily the money. It's not like just being cheap for the sake of being cheap. It's it's trying to find the essence of what are you trying to get out of a situation. We were just looking to spend time together. So every day at five o'clock for years, we would have a happy hour and it would cost us three dollars and we'd have a little time away from the kids. And we'd go out on our back porch and that was what we were looking for. Not, Mm -hmm. oh, let's get a babysitter. Oh, let's go to the brewery and spend all this money like this. And we actually wound up doing it more often because it was so easy and it was so cheap Mm -hmm. and it was right there. And we knew we were actually looking to get out of it. So, uh, so yeah, like those little things are, are really important, but you don't, you don't get that with an unexamined life, right? Like that's, mm-hmm. again, is part of the beauty of this is like, you can take a step back and say, oh, what am I looking for from my life? And I think, uh, you know, I, I hate to sound like a broken record, but like, it's just, it's so important. It really is. Yeah, totally. And in the example that I just gave about my friend too, if she had come over with a couple of them and maybe one of the kombuchas, we still could have shared all of that mm-hmm. together and had that experience, um, and had a little bit of it together if that was something that she was looking for to save money. So that was just like a funny Yeah, no, it's a, a great example, example. Alan. And, and just going back to something you said a minute ago also where you're like, you know, the, the person out there who might be hearing about finance, like you don't have to get there in three years or five years. It, it's, it's nothing like that. I think, I think how I kind of conceptualize it is most of us, who are just kind of sleepwalking through life and and living that kind of YOLO existence of I'm going to just spend everything because it feels good. 
you're going to wake up 30 or 40 years from now and you're probably going to have no money. You know, so if you apply just a little bit of intentionality, and it's, you don't have to overhaul your life, but just a yeah. little bit. Like you said, I mean, you said 10 years, 15 years. I mean, Ellen, that is, you think about a normal 80-year-old life, that's, that's 20% of your life that you just reclaimed yeah. by a little I bit know. of intentionality. That's, that's a mammoth difference, mammoth. So Yeah, because yeah, the difference of, of living intentionally with your money versus not is you're gonna, if you don't live intentionally, you're going to get to 70 and you might find yourself having no money and still having to work and still paying off a house and still, you know, all, all that aspect. So it doesn't mean that you don't spend your money on anything. You can still pick and choose what's important to me. And that can even go for material things. Like I said, for me, I really value buying quality furniture. If I'm willing to spend money on in that area and where am I willing to cut? Where am I willing to save in other areas like having a cheap car? Exactly. And for those people, you know, both you and I are, are we're not evidently car people, but there are people who greatly value their cars. So like, I don't want to make that like the, the boogeyman here of like, oh, you can't yeah. buy a nice car. Like that's the be all end all. If you, if you want to spend money on a car, go for it. If, if you truly value it, if you're doing it because your neighbor got a BMW and you want to keep up, that's kind of stupid. If you're doing it in my, in my <laughs> estimation, if you're doing it because <laughs> you truly value it, Go for it. That's the beautiful mm -hmm. thing. Like you can make decisions, but, 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 but there's a finite amount of money, right? So let's be clear. You need to make decisions. Again, it's not deprivation. You're not living a terrible life, but you need to make decisions because you cannot afford everything unless you just make an inordinate amount of money. And then you're probably not listening to this podcast or mine, right? Like about, about, <laughs> yeah. about saving money and getting financially independent. So, uh, totally. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's just about choice and it's about intentionality. So you're a CPA, an accountant, and you said that you're always been frugal, right? So what what point in your life did you realize? Was it something like numbers? Did numbers come across and you're like, wait a second, if I did this, I could retire? Like, what was your story yeah. that made you realize and why are you passionate about it? Yeah, that is a great question. So yeah, I mean, I guess I have always just been like, there were all these like family stories of me, like going back to like when I was 13 and I like worked in a comic book store and I saved every dollar, you know, it's just all these silly little stories. But, uh, so I think I, I did naturally have it, but for me, so I had a couple of inflection points in terms of like the numbers and then kind of like the value of Phi. So the numbers, when I was like 19 years old, I wound up getting an internship, which sounds super fancy and it was not at all, but like at this local, this investment firm. And it was, it was terrible. Honestly, it was just like cold calling client. It was, you know, I, I didn't learn all that much, but what I did learn, which changed my life, which was just like a lightning bolt was one of the brokers sat me down in front of a compound interest calculator of, okay, if you put at that time, I think like the Roth IRA, contribution limits were like $2,000 a year or something. And like, it was okay. If you put in, I was 19 years old. So if you put in $2,000 a year for the next 20 years, and then it, it grows at whatever, I, I think I put in 10% a year, which is not outlandish. I was like, I gamed it out until I was 99. I was, you know, essentially like a billionaire or worth like $500 million or something crazy like that. And, and you know, the example, again, I'm doing this from memory. The example is silly, but I think the lightning bolt moment was, oh, wow, compound interest and compounding your money matters so very much. And the number of years that you can be invested also matters significantly. And now that's not to say somebody who's getting a late start is screwed and they should not start not saying that at all. But clearly the sooner you can start investing, the better. And it was just like, it was just so eye opening to see that small amounts can turn into massive amounts when you think long term. So that was, that was the big aha moment for me. So can we explain then, and, and can you break down the stock market and just how to how to save your, like what you do with the money when you get it? Because I think a lot of people listening might have, okay, I'm on the track of the Rachel Cruz, Dave Ramsey. I listened to that episode. I'm getting out of debt and maybe I'm starting to save even like 500 a month. Yeah. 
Like, what do you do with that money? Where, like, can you just, I think a lot of people are intimidated by the stock market. Like they're like, I'm afraid to put my hard earned money somewhere that I just don't know where it's going to go. I could lose it. I don't know what to do with it. I don't know which account to go in. So can you just give everybody some baby steps and simple things that just help them feel confident moving forward on how to invest their money so that they can have that reward of what you're talking about? Yep. No, I absolutely can. And I think one of the nice things is that there has never been a better time to be an investor, a, a personal investor, a small scale investor, and not have to rely on some expert to do it, that you can actually do it yourself. And I think, you know, it's funny because I, I know you said, sure, I'm a CPA and I, I should have some financial knowledge, but, but investing was always really scary to me because it, it always seemed like something. So you're actually talking to the me of 10 or 15 years ago. So I can very, very much relate because this truly was me. And it seemed scary. It seemed like something that you needed an expert, that there was some insider knowledge that you were, you know, all these other buzzwords, the playing the market and you're gambling. And, and I think the, the thing that changed my life was a book called The Simple Path to Wealth by J.L. Collins, who's actually become a friend of mine. He's a, 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 the elder statesman in the FI community. And he's, uh, he, he applied some certainty to it. And I think investing is actually one of the, the only areas of life that I've ever seen where the less you know, the better results you're going to have. I kid you not. I know that sounds insane. But truly, the less you know, the less you fiddle, especially the try to outsmart the market, try to time the market by selling and buying or getting a hot tip on Tesla or whatever, whatever uh, the stock du jour is. That's, that is like a loser's game. And the, all the studies bear that out. Like I look at life almost in terms of like the poker table, like what is, what's, what are the decisions I can make that give me the highest likelihood of success in the long term? And what actually has been proven over and over again is that uh, index fund investing. So in essence, buying a little piece of hundreds of companies all at once. Because Ellen, I think the, the biggest kind of step back here before I even get into that is when you're buying a stock, when you're, when you're investing in the stock market or truly investing in a company, you're actually buying a little ownership piece of that company. We don't think about it like that because we think about it, like I said, of playing the market or gambling or whatever, or I'm looking to make a quick buck and is this going to go up or down in the next couple days? No, I I think that's the wrong way of looking at it. I think you should look at it as, hey, when I buy a share of stock of, let's say, Amazon, for instance, I'm buying a little ownership piece of Amazon and all of their worldwide operations. That's a fundamentally different thing than I'm buying a little piece of paper or digit on the computer that I hope goes up and down. And you look at, well, wow, what, is, what is this business going to do? What are the 2 million people who work for Amazon? Those are now people who are working to do their job, to do all these good things, you know, bring these essential items to people. And now I'm an owner of that business. So in essence, I'm reaping the war, the rewards of a well-run business and a profitable business. And, you know, again, I'm using Amazon as an example, but when you invest in, let's say an S and P 500 index fund, you are getting a little piece of 500 of the biggest companies in America. So you're go- you're getting a little ownership piece of that. And you don't have to be smarter than the market. You don't have to be some titan of, of Wall Street or some one of these ridiculous hedge fund people, which, you know, you can hear the sarcasm dripping from my voice. Like, I don't think those people know anything, frankly, like after all is said and done, like after all the fees they charge you, I don't think there's any way that over a 40 or 50 year period, which I think is the only way to look at this is long term, that they're going to outperform just the market. It's never been proven that they can, which again, then gives certainty to people like me from 10 years ago. And you know, the, the people that you just wanted me to talk to is you don't have to be smarter than the market. You can just buy the market and there's never been an easier and cheaper way to do it than going to a very reputable company, like, like a Vanguard or Fidelity or Charles Schwab 
and opening up an account and just, you said $500, put that $500 in there every month or every X number of weeks that you can and just buy an S&P 500 index fund or a total stock market index fund. And, you know, again, I, it, I'm not supposed to give financial advice. I'm giving financial advice to myself from 10 years ago. Like, this is what I, I would have done, what I do today, Alan. So, like, obviously, everybody's situation is different. But, like, that to me is the highest likelihood of success because you're not getting crushed with those fees. You're not getting crushed with timing and letting your your little human brain get in the way of, oh, I'm scared or, oh, the market's going up and now I want to put all my money in. And like we, we get it wrong. We just get it wrong and we need to take our brains out of it, which is why if you just do this week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, you're going to wake up with more money than you could possibly imagine. And again, like I said, the less you know is actually the better in this sense because it, it helps you sleep at night. You're not trying to beat the market. You're just trying to match the market. And it's super easy. I mean, I think most people listening to this could open up an account at a Vanguard. I'll use Vanguard, for instance, because I think their, their customer service is great. And if you have a problem, you call them up and they, they walk you right through it because they've helped millions of people like you do this. And they understand that it's daunting and it's scary. But it really doesn't have to be. And that's the cool thing. You just, you link up your bank account, you send the money over, you know, just Google Vanguard total stock market index fund. You'll get like a little, uh, it's called VTSAX. And again, I'm not giving financial advice of this, but like, that's what I invest in. And you just buy as many, you buy $500 worth. And then a month later, you buy another $500 worth. And uh, I think it's actually pretty, pretty easy, which is super cool. Yeah, I think there's there's going to be people listening who are in the position that I have people in my life like this who are like, okay, I'm I'm out of debt. I just paid off, you know, car payment or loan or college loan or something like that. But now maybe they just have the mortgage, right? And then they're wanting to save some extra every month, but they just have it in like a regular bank account, like a regular savings bank account. They just don't know what to do. So I think this information that you're giving is really helpful. And then there's other people listening who are going, okay, I definitely don't have $500 a month, but the message that you have of finding little ways to cut, just start somewhere. Start somewhere where you can, what way can I save five, ten dollars a week, $30 a week that I can cut out by not spending on this or what subscription doesn't make sense for me in my life anymore. That type of stuff adds up. And then before you know it, at the end of the month, you're like, wow, I actually have $50, $100 to save. And that's where it goes to what you're talking about. Yeah, that is exactly right. And and yeah, the 500 was just, you know, we, we, we just made yeah, that just number Just a random up. number. <laughs> yeah. Since you said like, the person who might be just leaving it in their in their savings account. And I think I think again there there is there's psychological certainty to that because it, it feels safe of I'm not gonna lose money. Right. But but I think I think the best way to show what you're actually losing by not investing in the market is it, it's the concept of opportunity cost. It's what am I giving up? So sure Let's, let's just say I'm going to make up a, a crazy number because it, it'll just be easy for illustrative purposes of $100,000. Let's say you, you have $100,000 sitting in your bank account, okay? You've saved up for years and years and years, and which is a remarkable thing. Or, you know, fill in the blank. You got a, it's in somebody's will. You got $100,000, right? So you don't want to lose it. You don't want to, you, you, you want to hold on to that as tightly as you can. But in like a regular bank account, you're essentially going to get no interest, right? It's just going to sit there. So 30 years from now, or let's say 40 years from now, it's still going to be essentially $100,000 because it will, have not, it will not have grown. You won't have lost anything, right? So you succeeded wildly and, you, and you're, hey, I don't want to lose. I want this to be safe. But, but what did you give up? And I think that's where when I was talking about when I was 19 years old and I saw this compound interest thing, I realized that, oh... The money grows and it doesn't sound like a lot at first, but that's the beautiful thing of compounding. And, and I have kind of a, a back, uh, just like an easy math way to do it is in rough terms. And of course, we can never know the future, right? But like in general terms, the stock market goes up on average about 8% per year. Okay. Now, again, who knows what's going to happen in the future, but let's just, we'll just use that for instance. That means your money will double basically every nine years. Okay. 
So uh, wow. every nine years, which is amazing. So now, like I said, 40 <laughs> yeah. years, we're talking, there's four and a half doubles in there, right? Because nine, 18, 27, 36, and then essentially another half a double. So what that means is 100,000 goes to 200,000, then 400,000, 800,000, 1.6 million, and then we still have half of a double. So we're, st- we're going to get over $2 million, okay? So just by having invested that 100,000 and then basically going to sleep, because like I said, the people who perform worst in the market are those who are watching CNBC every day or listening to Jim Cramer or Susie Orman and, and oh, is, is, is now a time to sell? No, just go to sleep. Don't worry about it. And sure, there are going to be times where that, that balance goes down 30% in a year, but then it comes rip roaring back. And if you sold at the wrong time, you would stop all that compounding. So again, let's say $2 million, right? So that is the concept of opportunity cost is what was I giving up? So in, in that first instance, yeah, you've got that hundred grand. It's sitting there safe as can be. It's in Fort Knox basically, right? FDIC insured, you're good to go. But you would have had over $2 million through the beauty of compounding. So you And not to mention not to mention that what that hundred thousand dollars worth is worth thirty years from now is less. <laughs> so you actually are losing money because it's not worth a hundred thousand dollars in thirty years anymore. Yeah. That's a brilliant point. So yeah, inflation certainly by as we certainly as we know from the last year or two, uh yeah, that's a that is a great, great point to add on. Thank you so much for for doing that, Ellen. And yeah, it's <laughs> but, it's but it is, it's both of them. It's both of them. It's wild. So you, you know, that like that's just that compounding, I think for people conceptually to understand like, oh, in, on average, my money is going to double every nine years. And that's, it, it, it's wild when you look at potentially like what your net worth is today and you're still saving. Like, so, I mean, it's going to, for people who are still saving, their money is going to double well quicker than every nine years, which is another kind of cool wrinkle to this, you know, just as you're conceptualizing like a net worth or like we talked about earlier of, oh, it's about, my FI number is about 25 times my current spending, right? And it's all kind of part and parcel. I I know I said I didn't want to get bogged down in the math, but like, I think think we've done this where the numbers are, they they make enough sense that I think people understand the, the conceptual framework. You don't have to get bogged down because plenty of people get bogged down. Is it, is it 25 times my annual expenses? Is it 30? Is it like, you can quibble at at the margins, and, and and I understand that it's important at some point, but realistically, like I look at it as like like north star, as opposed to, you know, the Susies of the world saying I need ten million or fifteen million or whatever it is. I don't care about that. I care about my north star. My north star is my life costs this. I multiply that by twenty five. That's the number I need to hit. And then when I have the the power of compounding on my side, it makes it a whole heck of a lot easier. Yeah. And I think your illustration is really important because a lot of people are going through life thinking, oh, I just can't save. And, you know, it's not worth it. Even that what's what's the 20 extra dollars going to do this week or the 30 extra dollars because I'll save later or like I'll, I'll get there eventually. But the importance of what you're saying that if you start now, it's that I say this over and over in the podcast, not just related to finances, but in anything in life of like the short term hard work for long term gains. If you're always procrastinating and putting it off for later, like you're going to get to the end and be like, dang it, I should have done that. I shouldn't have bought this, this or that that I didn't really need and didn't actually bring joy in my life. I could have saved it and quadrupled my money. <laughs> yeah, you're right. And made life a lot easier to to have more freedom of time, like you said. Yeah, everything good comes from that long-term thinking in every aspect of life. It really is. Yeah. So I have a question, though, about right now. Like, I know what you're saying, that you just don't worry about when the market dips and, like, you know, it'll eventually go up and just don't look at it and don't fiddle with it. But is it different right now? Like, there is such an in, like insane amount of inflation. People are worried about how much money they've already lost in the stock market if they already do have money like what are your thoughts right now about people who are maybe on that trajectory but they're seeing they're seeing some really insane things happening yeah no i mean listen i i totally get it and i'm clearly a human being with uh with feelings and emotions and 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 i get the the fear i think we all a lot of us live through that multiple times in our adult lives especially not not least of which was was march of 2020 right when it looked like who knew what was going to happen with the stock market it was plummeting and what is the future going to look like? So 
believe me, I know how important the psychology is. And I think it can never be overstated. Like you need to, like, I, I know I'm a CPA and I know I've been talking a lot about math, but I'm not actually like a math guy when it comes to it, because I think the, like the sleep well at night test is something you need to pass with, with a lot of this, which is even, and I, I will get to your actual pertinent question, but like, even like with, uh, like paying off your mortgage, right? I think for a lot of us, not for people who are getting mortgages now, but people who have gotten mortgages in the last handful of years, you've gotten all time low rates. They're like two, three, three in the threes, uh, percent. I mean, that is historically low. You almost certainly could, if you were talking about, Hey, do I pay off the mortgage quickly? Or do I invest the difference? Like the investing, because right, like you grapple with this, I grapple with it, we all do. And it's like mathematically, it almost certainly, almost certainly makes sense to invest it at that low interest rate. But the sleep well at night test is, man, wouldn't it feel amazing to have no mortgage, right? Like how wonderful would it feel? So I get that. I'm so, I so get it and I'm so sympathetic to it that I think I probably am even more on the side of the emotion, but I think you need to understand what is like useful in that sense of like, that is truly psychological well-being as opposed to fear-based reaction, right? And fear-based reaction is, hey, the stock market just went down 10%. I'm going to sell everything and go back in that bank account. And that money's just going to sit there forever because man, once you sell it's really hard to get back in. It's really, really hard. And, you know, you, you're thinking long-term and I think of course, and it's going to depend on who the person is, right? Like if you're looking to buy a house in a couple of years or that money is sitting there to pay for your kid's college and that's happening next year, that's a totally different scenario than someone we're talking about. Like you're investing for retirement 20, 30, 40 years from now. Right. I think for people who have that long term mindset and the long term timeline, I think you really need to try to avoid the noise. And I know it's hard. I really, I truly know. But for people who are investing now, who are just getting started, maybe they're listening to this podcast and they're like, oh, wow, maybe I should go open that, that, you know, and, and invest in a low cost Vanguard account. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like open the account today. There's probably no better time to invest than when everything, is on sale, right? If, if you think about it, like we talked about, when you're buying shares of stock or you're buying mutual funds, you're buying an ownership piece of a company. So if you don't think, obviously for something that you think the company has changed dramatically or, there, or there's something terrible, well, that's, that's a different story. But if we're talking about just like amazon.com, or I, I keep using that, it's a bad example, like Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway or Apple, right? Like companies that people love. If it's 30% off now from where it was last year, and you don't think anything fundamentally has changed, but just that, that people are scared right now, well, in every other aspect of life, when things are on sale, people flock to it, right? Like we want to buy on sale, but we don't want to buy stocks on sale. We're, we're sick, scared to death to buy stocks on That's sale. Interesting. Right? Isn't it yeah. wild? Uh huh. Mm-hmm. When you think about that, and it's like, oh, I'm still getting that same ownership piece of this company but I'm getting it for 30% less or 50% less. So if you're in that stage of life, which most of us are, where we're saving money and we're still in that accumulation stage, seeing all this, all this happen, all this turmoil is actually not a terrible thing at all because you're able to just keep on accumulating shares of that same company for a fraction of what you would have spent in the high flying years of, of a year or two ago. Yeah, that's interesting. And this is like a tangent question, but since you've brought up like specific businesses, it makes me think of um, like conscious um, investing because I have a lot of um, like a lot of my audience, a good chunk of them, I think are really um, careful and conscious with the way that they spend their money ethically and might not agree with certain businesses that are really big top businesses. Like a lot of people have a problem with Amazon. Which is why I actually stopped. (laughs) I realized that actually. 
But a lot of people love it. A lot of people don't. There's there's pros and cons. Um, things that people love about it. Things that people don't love about it. Like it's cha- it's made life a lot easier in so many ways. But then it's also people have trouble with the monopoly aspect. So I just think of multiple businesses that like maybe an ethical vegan like myself, where you're investing money and you don't know if you're investing in McDonald's or a different animal food type of products. So. What, has, is that something that ever comes into your conversation? And to me, that sounds like it would be a little bit more detailed where you have to like pick certain things, which makes it something that's more savvy, not as the whole, just put it in there. You don't have to think about it. But I'm just curious if that's something that's on people's minds as they're listening. Yeah. Yeah. What a brilliant question. It, it is unquestionably on people's minds. And, you know, I, I, I struggle with this, honestly. And, and I think it's because like I'm, I'm so sympathetic to that, to the viewpoint. And like, you don't want to invest in companies that you find abhorrent or you think are doing terrible things, right? Like, yeah, I mean, there, there certainly are mutual funds that I think the ESG, they call them. And, uh, yeah, sustainability. I forgot. I, I unfortunately don't know the exact acronym, but, uh, ESG. And yeah, I mean, I think the tough part is like you said, you in essence are picking companies. And I think that just from like a long-term math standpoint, like I think that is where it, it's just so hard. And yeah. I, I don't, I, you can tell I'm conflicted. You can hear it in my voice yeah. because I don't have yeah, a good yeah. answer to it. It's like what, what I, what my, my thought for my own life is I'm using this as, as my, my wealth building strategy. And then I can spend that wealth in the ways that I see fit and adding value to the world, giving to the organizations that I want to give that that's, that's how I sleep well at night. I I don't think that's a satisfactory answer for most, for everybody. No, it is. But I think it is on some level. It's very, it's an interesting nuanced conversation. Like I see both sides to it. Cause what you're saying is like, look, the way that I'm actually going to spend money in my life is going to be like towards the companies that I find ethically sound that you really like but when it comes to investing your money it's just it's like a whole different ball game to just be like i'm gonna pick and choose like it's just very different yeah it is and it's just oh man it's to me it's just such it lowers the likelihood of you of you reaching your financial goals which are really your life goals then and it's so that's why i'm so conflicted it's like i know i know there are so many people and i said i'm sure there are companies that i'm invested in that i that I find abhorrent and, but it's helping me reach my financial goals, which I think help me make the world a better place. So yeah, it's, it's hard. It's so hard. You could go it's in circles, so hard you know? To know. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be curious anyone listening or watching if they could share in the comments, their thoughts on it. Cause I, I find it very, very confusing to know like yeah. what, what you're supposed to do. Cause it's kind of just infiltrated everywhere. I mean, it's, unless you're like super finance, like financially savvy with that. It does, I don't know if that is something that you can just pick and choose. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard, but, but there are many of those options for those ESG funds. So, uh, I have never really dove into the exact holdings of each and, uh, but it certainly is better than picking just one individual stock. I think that that's a very tough game. So, you know, it, it's probably kind of almost meeting in the middle in terms of like a, a total stock market index fund versus a, a single stock. Okay, so to switch gears, you mentioned uh, this book you love called The Simple Path to Wealth. And I wanted to ask you, like, what, what exactly is wealth? Is it just money or is it also wealth and happiness and lifestyle? Because it sounds like to you, like it's all intertwined. Um, in regards to the financial independence aspect, you know, because a lot of people might be thinking, you know, money doesn't bring you happiness. It's these other things. But that's kind of your point is that you don't need to be making all this money to spend it on things. It's that you want to make money to be able to and be careful and intentional with your money so that you can live a life that is about like your your wealth of of happiness and lifestyle. Can you elaborate on that a little more? Yeah. So for me, certainly wealth is not just a number. I think, uh, you know, that, that would just be, I, I know there are people who keep scorecards of like how much they're worth and that's like, you know, determines their, their value in, in life. I just think that's just a, a pretty sad existence. And it, like, to me, if you, but, but saying that money is not important, I think it's also equally silly because whether we like it or not, the world runs on money. 
It just does. And you need to have, you work for money, you give up that, again, the only thing that matters, which is your time, you give it up in order to earn money. The vast majority of us do, right? And if you can get to a point where just being intentional and living below your means and saving money can get you to a point of not having to trade that time for for money for in a job that that doesn't light you up well i mean of of course i'm going to do that right like of course i'm going to live that intentionality of course i'm going to save and then to your point about you know the word wealth i think then it affords you the ability going back to what i said before like the biggest stressor in most people's lives it's money and when you don't have that stress then you can have a wealth of X, fill in the blank, right? You can have a wealth of connections. You can have a wealth of, of health and fitness that maybe you can't devote the time and energy to when you have to drive to your job and spend nine or 10 hours there and drive home and you're exhausted, right? Like you can cultivate relationships. You can give back to the community. You can do all of these things that I think make a truly wealthy life. And not just numbers on, on a computer screen. Like if, if it stopped and started with numbers on a computer screen, I think you've lost at the game of life already. And, and yeah. I think it's just, it is so much more, but, but to me, that is the lead domino. That's that having some space financially. And it doesn't mean having millions of dollars. It doesn't mean even being at Phi, right? Like you have, when you have like I said before, $5,000 saved up, or you have a six month emergency fund. Well, you have power that you never had before in your life. You're not beholden to a job that tells you to do the wrong thing or something you don't agree in. You talked about, about ethical investing. Well, what about unethical things that go on every day or just things that are against your value system that you don't have to do anymore? Because most of us are worried about our lives falling apart in 30, 60, 90 days, right? Like if you got fired because you stood up for yourself or you left and you had no income for 60 days, most people are going to have a tough time paying the mortgage. They're potentially going to lose the house. Like they can't stand up for themselves. Well, when you have money saved up, you sure as hell can stand up for yourself, right? Everything changes. And I think that to me is just, it's like such another crucial aspect of what we're doing here. Yeah, I love what you said. And on top of it, when we talk about money going, the making the world go round, it just reminds me of how money is like an energy exchange. So if you're being intentional with how you're spending your money or not spending your money in in certain ways, then in other ways you can be intentional in ethically um, made companies and sustainably sourced. Like for instance, the shirt I'm wearing, like it's I know that the shirt I'm wearing was created by uh, women who were ethically treated ethically and that it was the material is ethically sourced, like things like that, that I'm willing to spend more money on, that I'm being careful to spend less in other ways. And then I'm willing to spend more money in, in these certain ways, like the example I just, I just explained. So I think, I think everything you said is so, so fascinating and important. So for people listening, then can you explain some tips for reducing their spending? Where are they overspending? How can we maximize our income um, and savings to not be a slave to our job? Let's just break down some of your favorite tips. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, for most of us, it, it starts with just being honest with yourself financially, maybe for the first time. So again, super stressful finances. Let's, let's just be honest here, right? Like most of us don't want to talk about it. Most of us don't want to think about it. Right. So we have no idea what we're spending. We have no idea what our finances look like because we're scared, because we're nervous, because we know it doesn't look good. Right. So what do you do when that happens? You stick your head in the sand. You procrastinate. That's easy. You know, my life hasn't blown up yet. So I'm going to just keep on, keep on rocking and rolling. Right. So I think really the the thing is you got to be honest. You have to sit down and just get it all on paper. Okay, so like my very first thing to, to get started with is just write it all down. So go, hey, what, what am I bringing home? Look at your paycheck, right? What am I bringing home? And then just go to your bank account, go to your credit card, and you don't have to tick and tie every dollar because again, when you get bogged down in detail, you stop because it, it's uncomfortable and it doesn't feel good, you know? But just get close. Hey, what does my life even cost? 
some of us don't have any clue. Like how much are we spending on cable every month or, or our cell phones or whatever, or all these recurring things. There might be recurring subscriptions in there that you don't even know you're paying anymore, right? Like you might've signed up for uh, whatever Apple TV to watch Ted Lasso. And now, and now you haven't watched in a year and you're still paying every month because you just forgot. And again, because you had your head in the sand, which again, is perfectly normal. You didn't look at your, <laughs> your bill. So you didn't see that it was there. So that, that clearly is the first step. But then also as clearly is you need to take action, right? Like you need to make some change. If you're living paycheck to paycheck or you're in the red every month, you're, you're in a negative, you have to, you have to do something. And I think as much as, again, this is not about depriving yourself the easiest way, the first steps are to cut things because a lot of us, a lot of us have those subscriptions that just keep on rolling and we don't know about, or we're spending in ways that are mindless. And I think a lot of people like low hanging fruit is I've seen is food, food budget. Like a lot of us, and it's, it doesn't mean don't buy high quality products. That clearly is not the case, but I think a lot of people, because they're so stressed all the time, because they haven't planned, they haven't done any type of meal planning, they're very reactive. And I think anytime you're reactive, you're, you're just kind of beholden to the moment and you have to, you have to eat, right? Theoretically. So you have to, you pay what you pay. So, uh, whereas if you sat down on a Sunday and meal planned, for the coming week and you bought ingredients and you bought complementary ingredients that could potentially get you two different types of meals, right? And you make, you double up the quantity. So then, okay, I just have to cook two meals and maybe that's four dinners for, for our family. And maybe there's some leftovers. Even maybe if we're super lucky where we've got five meals out of this. Okay. Well then you're not scrambling. So you're not stressed. You don't have to waste that time. It's almost invariably going to be cheaper. I mean, in 99% of cases to cook at home than it is to go out last minute. Hey, I've got to run to the grocery store and grab something from the hot buffet for $13 a pound, right? Like that's what a lot of people do. But so it's planning ahead. I think for most families, for most people, there are hundreds of dollars a month in, in food savings, not by eating a lesser quality, but just by being intentional. I think, you know, just a simple example that I use, which is, is my kind of value, I, my valuist is, is the phrase we use. Uh, okay, I'm not depriving myself, but, but I want to be intentional. So like my cell phone, for instance, most people spend whatever it is, $100 a month, even today's day and age, $100 a month plus on a cell phone for unlimited data and, and this and that. Well, I looked at it and said, oh, you mean there are, there are a lot of these companies like Mint Mobile or Republic Wireless, that when you're on Wi-Fi, you have unlimited data and talk and text, and it costs like 10 or $15 a month. And you get maybe one or two gigabytes of data, which is not that great, but it's not terrible. And that's going to save me $85 per line, basically, or, or thereabouts, right? So for my wife and I, it's like, we're talking like 160 bucks a month that we saved by going to Mint Mobile or Republic Wireless. And because we're on Wi-Fi 99% of our lives, the only thing we had to give up was when we're not on Wi-Fi, we basically don't go on YouTube or download podcasts. Mm -hmm. Literally, that's mm -hmm. the only decision I made. And that's $160 a month. That's almost $2,000 a wow. year. Wow. Yeah, that's a that's a big one. I feel like that's a, that's something that a lot of people could do. I mean, one of the things that we do is we have we have Verizon, but we don't have unlimited because that was like an extra thirty dollars a month. So we're saving thirty dollars there, but we have to be intentional that when we're out and not on Wi Fi to not really like use it very often, or else we're gonna get like an overage charge. But like my husband had calculated, even if we got an overage charge like two times a year, that still would be less than if we had the unlimited and paid the extra $30 a month. So things like that. But what you mentioned is, is really, uh, I think even better because <laughs> saving a lot more money. But you know, in, in, to your credit, you, you two applied a lot of intentionality to that, which is awesome. Like you thought that through and okay, maybe it doesn't make sense to just YOLO and like, of course we want the unlimited because we can afford it, right? Like 
Mm-hmm. It's the thought process, right? Like even for anybody listening to this, it's not even the little the little details. You can save on, on your phone. You could save a ton of places, but it's the thought process of, oh, maybe there's a different way. Maybe mm-hmm. there's some little change that I can make, like going back to the happy hour that I talked about before. Like maybe there's some little change that I could make. And in this case, like you said, it's not so little. I mean, that's that's a mm-hmm. massive savings. But is it is it saving and giving up nothing in return? No, of course not. You always have to make a little adjustment. But like I said, in my case, I just don't download podcasts when I'm not at my house. I download them before I'm at my, you know, while I'm at my house and I listen to them uh, in the car or whatever. So I'm not really giving anything up, but I just have to be a little bit intentional. So I think like that, that's really the, the thought process behind. But yeah, for most people, it's get this down on paper, look for those recurring subscriptions that are just eating you up that you didn't even realize were there. And then, you know, maybe look the low hanging fruit of you could probably save a couple hundred bucks a month in food, maybe a cell phone. And then you get into like bigger things, obviously, of if your cars, you you mentioned before, like we were talking about cars. And I I mean, most people spend five to five hundred to a thousand dollars a month on their car. Well, I mean, is that probably the best way to spend your money if you don't value it? Like, no, you could probably buy a car and hold it for instead of leasing a car or whatever. Like I've had my car for 10 years or I had my prior car for 15 years and it gets me from point A to point B. And I mean, when you compound all the money that I've saved on that, it literally is hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like I I kid you not that that's what it comes out to. So it can be a massive difference. Yeah. The car is a really important one because a lot of people listening to this might be living in a in a place where status is just all around you. Like I know I grew up in Orange County where everybody, almost everybody had really nice cars. Doesn't mean that they could afford it. Just because they looked like they had the money doesn't mean they actually have the money. And the amount of people that are Pay, are, are buying new cars when they really don't can't afford it. Like I think, what is the Dave Ramsey thing that you shouldn't buy a new car until your net worth is like a million dollars? Something really out, something yeah. really provocative. Like that's a really provocative statement because so many people just buy new cars, and that doesn't mean that they don't value. Because you're saying, oh, maybe you just don't value having a nice car. I think a lot of people would like, yeah, I'd like a ni- a new car. Like that sounds nice, but how much? Does that is that worth it to you compared to the the results and the reward of what you're saying that hey if you saved it is that worth more than the nice car and that's the inspiring part because I think a lot of people are like yeah I would love a nice car but do you love that more than the ability to retire this many years earlier and having that x amount of money double quadruple if you just invest it and buy the cheaper car like that's the thing that is that I have to do in my brain. Yeah, I love that thought process. And, and just to kind of even bring it back to numbers, right, is, uh, and this is an interesting thing. So every $100 of recurring expenses that you can cut out of your life per month, right, $100 is actually $30,000 less that you need to reach financial independence, 30000 So we're talking about $1,000 a thousand dollar car payment, right? That fancy car, you're leasing it forever, thousand bucks a month. That's three hundred thousand dollars more you need to reach financial independence with that thousand bucks a month. Three hundred thousand. Wow. So that's real wow. money. And you can apply that yes. then, right? Like the hundred and sixty bucks that I saved on my cell phone, that's like fifty grand less that we need. Yep. Fifty thousand dollars just for making for not yeah. downloading podcasts when I'm out of my house. Yeah. Yeah. That like, that's the, this is the ticket to the stuff that is inspiring because I just picture myself even listening to this conversation while I'm doing dishes or the kids are in the background and I'm like, wait a second, I need to reevaluate. Like, where can I cut my spending? Because that, that, that reward is, is something so few people are talking about. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it really, it's important. And, and I think it's, it's providing that, that, impetus, you know, for people that to feel that they can really do this, they can affect change in their life, right? Like, that's why we, we, we talk about this stuff. That's why we talk about like making better changes and making decisions in your life. It's you actually can affect change on your life. It's not some like elusive they that's impacting you. It's you, you can make positive changes. And like, I just find that so compelling and rewarding. And it's just like, you can tell it lights me up. It's just, it's amazing. Yeah, it does. So you talked about the car, which is bigger, is a bigger ticket item. What about like the other bigger factors that are in like the Playing With Fire documentary of people who 
literally moved their entire life to a place that was much cheaper to live in. Like I'm living in one of the most expensive states in America. Like for us, that's something that is the value of being able to grow tropical fruit, fruit, food in our garden was like something that was worth it to us. And we figured out all the other ways that we could sacrifice. Like my husband worked 50 to 60 hours a week for the first like couple years when we moved here. And that was like a sacrifice that we made because of our long-term goals. But some people have the obstacle, opposite goal where they're like, okay, where can I work less um, and have a cheaper everything? Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it, it, this is hard. This is real hard because, uh, I mean, where you live is is the most personal of, of things. And and I, I don't want anybody to walk away from hearing this conversation and think like, oh, I have to do something. Like on the Playing With Fire documentary, they moved from, from San Diego and, and they were trying to find somewhere cheap to live. Like that, there's no one path to financial independence. And that's the picture that I've been trying to paint this whole, this whole hour so far is, is any positive change you make is going to help you, right? Now, let's not, I mean, we, you know, what's, what's the saying? The call is spade a spade. Like, clearly, your path to five, just all things equal, is going to be longer living in Hawaii than if you lived yeah. in Alabama or Mississippi or in Richmond, Virginia, where I lived, right? Like, there's no question about that. But, but you've made a very intentional decision that this is, this is the life we want to build. And I think that's the most important aspect of any of this conversation. So, you know, myself personally, and I can give you like really the most personal example is I grew up in the suburbs of New York City. So I grew up uh, on Long Island. My wife and I grew up eight minutes apart and, you know, we were both CPAs. We could have made a life there unquestionably. Like we had... We had upside potential. We weren't making a ton of money when we, when we moved away, but you know, we were 25, 26 years old and we had, we could have both been partners at a big accounting firm or whatever it was, but we knew that we would always have to give something up that we didn't want to give up and that was not worth it to us. So living, living in the only place we'd ever lived, right? With all of our family and friends, that was obviously a big draw. And it was not easy to move away, but it was in service of a future that we wanted to live into, right? And for us, that superseded that future goal of one of us staying home with our future kids. They didn't exist at that point. They were fictional future kids, as they call it. Like, and that was more important. So that was a decision that we made that was, I mean, that's not an easy thing to move away from your family and friends, but it was in service of a life that we wanted. So I think if you, if that matters to you, you know, this is a very personal calculus and, and it's not my place to say what everybody should do or what anybody should do. But, but I think if you're asking me like, you know, it, will it help you to move to a lower cost of living area where for me, at least like everything was cheaper. I mean, Ellen, it's crazy. Like my car insurance was half the price. Our utilities were half the price. The groceries were a fraction. Like the house was a third of what it like. Of course it's easier, obviously. That, that It's almost like self-evident, but that doesn't mean it's the right decision for everybody. Mm-hmm. So I, I think yeah. uh, you know that's the best way I can answer is with my own personal anecdote. No, I think that's good. I think a lot of people just don't even consider though that they have options like that you – that look, you don't have to be stuck into the situation that you're in right now. But that kind of leads me to my – one of my last questions that I also asked Rachel Cruz when I had her on the podcast that um, is it a privilege to even have this ability to – like for instance, some people are so, so strapped for – um, in the situation they're in, maybe they're a single a single parent, or they have a super super low income job and just don't know how they could possibly cut cut in any way in their life. Like, is it a privilege to even be having this conversation? Like, what what are your thoughts and takeaways on that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's no question it's a privilege. I think anybody who thinks otherwise is is kind of foolish or or deluding themselves. It, obviously, without question. This, this message of financial independence, reaching financial independence, this is not going to be applicable tomorrow to everybody. It just isn't. And, you know, why, why I said at the very beginning is this, that, you know, that said, 
the benefits of phi, I think, are broadly applicable to everybody in the sense that we know how stressful finances are. It, it, it's the only, like, when your finances are in bad shape, it's the only thing that matters. It's all pervasive. It's there at every moment. And if you can get to a point, and, and I don't begin to say that I can, I can put myself in the shoes of someone working three jobs and that, oh, just save extra money. Like there are people who do that cavalierly, like, like they could just make changes and uh, that's ridiculous. But, but I think for nearly everybody, we can make some small changes that, that will put us in a better position tomorrow, a month from now, a year from now. Like I said, back at, at the beginning, it, that first time you have a thousand dollars saved up, or maybe not even a thousand maybe 200 or 500 things that used to be an emergency aren't anymore. And that is a vastly better place than if you were, you had a payday loan for $500. So it might take you, that might take you a long time to get to that point. But I think having the agency, the, that know how that like I'm making positive changes for myself and that saving this money, it actually matters. I feel like that will make it that makes a difference to people that that having that that bit of agency really does help. So so yeah, I mean the short answer to your question is like yes, obviously there's there's privilege. And it you'd be a fool to say somebody making $100,000 doesn't have it easier than somebody making 50 and somebody making 50 doesn't have it easier than somebody making 20. Right? And but I truly believe with every fiber of my being that this is a message that can help everybody. I really do. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I love the way that you put all that. And then on top of it, for people who are listening, because if you are listening to this on a computer or a smartphone, likely you have the means and the ability to at least make some changes in some ways. Like if you have that, if you're at that level, right, where you're even listening to this on a podcast um, or on YouTube or whatever. But it is inspiring to note that like the more that you are intentional with the, with the way that you save your money and the way you utilize your money, then as you um, get to a place of a little bit more freedom, then you also have that freedom to help others who are not in that situation. And that, that's part of the, the beauty of the, that message, I think. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree. Totally agree. Okay. So final like encouragement, takeaways for anyone listening, like what, how should we end this? Is there something that you'd like to share for people listening as a final takeaway? Yeah, I think, uh, well, thank you for listening. I think, I think this yeah. is really important. And I think, like I said, that, that agency, the, the being able to take action, I think that is like the thing that has emboldened people most that is, that have listened to choose FI all these years or, or even for a short time is that we constantly say you can take in all the information you want, right? But if you don't get up off the couch and take action, your life isn't going to get better. And there are people out there that want to support you in just in our own community. We actually have choose if I local groups. When I was in, when I was in Maui, we have a choose if I Maui group. We have Facebook groups in, in 300 cities all across the world, 25 plus countries of people who are looking to support other people who are trying to make their life better. And, but it starts with you. It starts with you getting up off that couch and taking action and, and wanting to make your life better. And I think, I think all the info is out there and I think you can do it. And we've, we've had so many people who have changed their life dramatically in a short period of time. And I think you can do it. And I think, I think it can start today. Love it. Cool. Thank you so much for this conversation. I think that I think I'm just like listening to it and being like, I could go re-listen to this and just be inspired and pumped by it. So I appreciate everything you're sharing. The numbers, I know you're saying you're trying to stay away from the numbers, but I think the numbers are inspiring. Nice. Well, I appreciate yeah. it. And thank you so much for having me on, Ellen. This is a blast. Love all the questions. And and yeah, it's uh, this this is important stuff. And I think uh, it's just cool that we can we can all just make our lives better. So uh, again, thanks for thanks for letting letting me share the message. Of course, and guys, please go check out his podcast, Choose FI, and just continue listening and being inspired. All right, we'll end it here. Thanks for being here. Thanks again. <laughs>